All right, now we're going to talk about our last market structure, oligopoly. Okay, now oligopoly is very interesting. In fact, we could probably do half a dozen lessons just on oligopoly because there is so much to understand about oligopoly. And so I want to try and only focus on a few essential concepts of oligopoly, and I want you to understand that we're keeping this at a principles level, but there is so much to understand about oligopoly. But let's go ahead and start at the beginning. Let's start with our basic dimensions of market structure. Oligopoly is a market structure in which there are many buyers but few sellers. Now this is one of the things that makes oligopoly so interesting. Because these few sellers, now when I say few sellers, I could mean only four or five, or I could mean only, you know, 19 or 20. But when you think of a lot of other market structures, aside from monopoly, obviously in monopoly there's only one seller. But when you think of perfect competition, where there are probably thousands of sellers, and in monopolistic competition there could be hundreds or thousands of sellers as well. For example, the restaurant industry is probably most character characteristic of monopolistic competition. And there are a lot of restaurants out there. There are a lot of fast food restaurants. There are a lot of, you know, sit down table service restaurants. You know, in one, uh, in one mall, let's say, you could have like two dozen restaurants all competing with each other, okay? But in oligopoly, comparatively speaking, there are far fewer sellers. And here's the interesting thing about those few sellers, is that they are all interdependent firms. What I mean by that is, the best analogy I can think of is, they're like brothers and sisters. They're like siblings to one another. They know one another very well. They know what one, an one another are doing most of the time. They'll join forces with one another and fight against one of the other siblings. Uh, so the idea of oligopoly, because uh, there are only few sellers and they're all in interdependent with one another, it creates a lot of very unique strategies and a lot of very unique circumstances that come, in, come up within these product markets. Okay. Uh, so oligopoly market power, uh, oligopolies, the, the, the sellers within oligopoly, they are price setters of just like uh, monopoly and just like monopolistic competition. In fact, one of the things we're going to talk about is how oligopolies, depending on the product market, uh, they often behave very similar to either monopolies or monopolistic competition, depending upon how well the siblings get along. Uh, so they all wind up being price setters. Now I am going to say as a side note that in many of these oligopoly markets that there will be a whole bunch of little siblings uh, that, that are also a part of the family, but they usually, uh, they usually don't really have much power at all. They usually just sort of follow the big brothers and the big sisters in whatever they're doing in terms of price and in terms of products that they're producing. So we're going to focus, when we talk about oligopoly, when we say few sellers, we're not going to talk about the little siblings that follow the big siblings around. We're going to mostly talk about the big brothers and the big sisters that sort of uh, lead everything that's going on in that market. Okay. Uh, now, do you remember when we discussed monopolistic competition? We said that one of the main reasons that monopolistic competition is a thing is because of product differentiation, right? Not so in oligopoly. In oligopoly, the reason oligopoly is a thing is because of the barriers to entry. That's really the reason that there are few sellers going on. That's because in oligopoly, there are very high barriers to entry. Now, when I say high barriers to entry, I don't mean as high as monopoly. We've already talked about monopoly, and we talked about how monopoly has very high barriers to entry, extremely high barriers to entry, so high that there's only one seller of that product. Well, here, the way that they are able to accomplish only having a few sellers is because, again, there are high barriers to entry. And we're going to focus on this in one of the segments uh, later, we're going to focus on the idea of one of the reasons why there are high barriers to entry is because of costs. It is very expensive 
to get into one of these industries. It's very difficult to break into one of these industries. Now, it's not impossible. In fact, one of the greatest stories, I think, of a, a, of a company that, that broke into an oligopoly market and was able to climb the ladder and become powerful is the story of Southwest Airlines. That's a big deal. You should check that out if you're interested. Uh, but um, really, the reason that it's so hard to get in these industries is because there are so many fixed costs and there are also very high variable costs. So the costs of uh, producing in an oligopoly market are so high that most companies just can't get into the industry. And, and that's because of a concept called economies of scale, and we'll talk about that later. The other interesting thing about oligopoly is that there's a lot of brand loyalty in oligopoly markets. And therefore, customers have already committed themselves that they buy mostly from this firm or that firm in the market. So when a new company wants to come in and get a bunch of customers, they have a very hard time getting new customers because the existing cu customers are already loyal to the brand of one of the few companies that is already dominating in the industry. Okay. All right. So when it comes to product differentiation, that's not really a big deal in monopolist or excuse me, in uh, oligopoly. In oligopoly, product differentiation, uh, they might be selling a heterogeneous product or they might be selling a homogeneous product. The product differentiation isn't what drives the oligopoly, not so much. Now, it can play an important role. In fact, if, uh, if there's a, a, a heterogeneous product, a product feature that's really excellent with one of the sellers, uh, that, then the other sellers may lose their brand loyalty. People may jump ship from one and go over to the other. For example, a great example of, a, of an ol uh, oligopoly is the cell phone industry. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people who they're very faithful to Samsung. That's their big deal. They buy, they only buy Samsung phones. And then there are other people who, you know, they really love their iPhone. And so they'll only buy an iPhone. Well, if you're an iPhone person, something would have to happen. You know, either the iPhone would have to be terrible or the Samsung would have to be really excellent for you to leave the iPhone and go over to the Samsung if you really enjoyed your iPhone so much. And so... Uh, sometimes the product can be so heterogeneous and have such great features that it'll pull customers away from the brand that they're accustomed to sticking with, okay? But it really, you know, you could just as easily have a homogeneous product that isn't, uh, that isn't very different than all the other firms, but you are still brand loyal. Uh, for example, gasoline, you know, oil companies, a lot of times people, you know, they only buy from certain gas stations for certain reasons, for one reason or another. And so, even though gasoline itself is a homogeneous product, for the most part. Now, when it comes to information symmetry uh, in oligopoly, these firms are very secretive. You know, they have reasons that they are successful in their industry. Uh, and th they try to guard those secrets. You know, th think kind of like siblings. Um, you know, if there's only a few sellers in the industry, don't siblings, they want to lock their door and keep their sibling from coming in and discovering all their deep, dark secrets and that kind of stuff uh, because uh, the, the other siblings could use it against them or something like that. I know I'm really pushing this analogy pretty far on the siblings, but the idea here with information symmetry is oftentimes these firms do know what one another is doing. But a lot of times, they keep their secrets from one another. And more importantly, as a group, they keep family secrets from the people on the outside. They don't want anybody on the outside coming into the family as a new kid because nobody wants a new young kid in the family, right? They want to keep their power positions where they are. So they're going to be very secretive from everybody on the outside, you know? Inside the family, we may fight with each other. But, you know, somebody from the outside tries to come in and fight with the family and we're all going to team up and we're going to we're going to fight that person and and knock them down. OK, so oligopolies, uh, they are very secretive about their information, especially uh, they try to keep secrets from their customers because they're, they don't want their customers knowing everything about how they do business or that will make the customers more powerful when it comes to what the price is that they're going to charge. And that's a very popular thing in the automobile industry, in the car industry. 
which is uh, many people consider that to be an oligopoly. They keep a lot of secrets in the automobile industry. They don't want customers to know how much it costs to make the car and how much it costs to sell it to the dealership because then the customer will go in and they'll, they'll bargain and haggle for a lower price. And so they try to keep those things secret from the customers if they can. All right, so the last thing I want to say about in this introduction to oligopoly is just like in monopolistic competition, uh, I would really encourage you, if this is interesting to you, if you see yourself having a future in the automobile industry or in the auto, or, or excuse me, in the oil industry or in the airline industry or banking, uh, you're, you may want to take an intermediate microeconomics class or an advanced microeconomics class when you get a master's degree, possibly, because that'll really teach you a lot more about uh, oligopoly, and you'll learn, you'll be able to dig a lot deeper. Okay. All right. So now, what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, what I call the um, oligopoly markets by the alphabet. All right, so now I want to do what I'm going to call uh, oligopoly markets by the alphabet. Okay, so we're going to go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, and so um, so uh, here A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Let's talk about some examples of oligopoly markets. The airline industry in the United States is an oligopoly market. Uh, the four largest ha that have almost all of the control of the uh, airline industry are Delta, American Airlines, United Airlines, and Southwest Airlines. Uh, I told you a little bit ago that Southwest Airlines started out as a very small airline that eventually grew and just took power and became one of the top four in the country. Okay, uh, The banking industry in the United States, we've got J.P. Morgan Chase, we've got Bank of America, Citibank, and Wells Fargo uh, control the largest uh, um, capital of banks and assets in the United States. Uh, look that up. Basically, to match the top four, the next 33 banks would have to join together as one thing to compete with these four banks, which is crazy. That's how much control these four banks have in the banking industry in the United States. Now, here's the interesting thing. A lot of these oligopoly companies have teamed together over the years. One of the things we're going to learn about later is the fact that, generally speaking, there is no shutdown in oligopoly. You don't shut down and leave the industry. What you do is you just merge with another company. Another company buys all your assets or buys out your company uh, and your name ceases to exist. But the but your assets continue doing business. For example, uh, back in I want to say uh, American merged with U.S. Airways. I want to say in uh, around 2009 or 2011, um, United Airlines uh, merged with Continental Airlines. And I know that Southwest it wasn't a huge merger, but Southwest merged with uh, AirTran at one point. Uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, used to be its own bank, and Chase Bank used to be its own bank. But J.P. Morgan and Chase they merged in 2000 to become one bank. Now the largest bank, uh, with the large, I believe, well, arguably the largest market share. Bank of America has been a, a, a snowball of several companies over the years. I've seen Bank of America just eat up. Uh, uh, several different um, banks from local banks, uh, regional banks, to become the largest. Wells Fargo has done something very similar. Now, car companies, uh, they're uh, pretty much an oligopoly, but there's more of them than, than there are airlines or banks. Uh, but you know them. You know, when you're ready to go buy a car, you're either going to buy a Toyota or a GM or a VW. You might be buying a Honda, right, or a Nissan or something like that, okay? There is a, a not a large number of car manufacturing companies. Uh, so then when we get to D, drugs, I use the word drugs, I mean pharmaceuticals. There are not there are only 10 or 12 big ones. The largest ones are Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson. Uh, then when we get to E, we've got electronics. Now, electronics is a very broad category. That's not one industry, but within electronics, we have a lot of different oligopolies. For example, operating systems for personal computers, there's only a few of them. Uh, uh, operating systems for phones, there's only a couple of them, okay? In terms of producing phones, physical phones, you know, you're either buying a Samsung or an Apple. Now, I know that there are other phones out there. Google has their phone, and there are some other companies that make phones, but generally speaking, uh, there, are many, there are some people who have referred to Samsung and Apple as having a duopoly, meaning there's only two companies within this industry making phones, where we can say that there are two companies that control the majority of the U.S. Uh, mobile phone company or, or mobile phone market or industry.
And then there's the film industry. There are five motion picture companies that control 76% of the market. Disney controls almost half of that. Disney is controlling about 33% of the motion picture industry. That is one third of all the movie, well, one third of all the movies or one third of all the uh, revenue coming from movies in, uh, in, the, in the United States or in the world. Uh, and then there's the uh, gasoline industry. You know, the biggest ones are Exxon Mobil, uh, BP, um, and, and there are a few more, um, Shell, uh, Chevron. Now, Exxon and Mobil actually used to be two separate companies, but they merged and became Exxon Mobil. Okay? And so I just want to show you these examples. These are companies that you have heard of, like probably all of them you have heard of. You know, oligopolies. Now, there are some oligopoly markets that you may have never heard of. For example, the steel industry is probably an oligopoly, at least in the United States. You may have never heard of some of those companies, like Nucor Steel and, um, and similar companies. Uh, but what I want to show you here is the idea that, um, that there aren't many of them. Uh, in these industries, okay? And one of the biggest things we're going to focus on is the fact that, you know, these are fa families of sorts, you know? These four airline companies, you know, they're like siblings. They fight with each other, you know? They compete with each other, but they also cooperate with each other. And that's what siblings do. They cooperate sometimes and they compete sometimes. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to talk about the difference in oligopoly, whether the siblings, are they more likely to compete with one another or are they more likely to cooperate with one another.